So um, why don't we start with the, the COVID chair? That's pretty interesting. Yeah, I found uh, this little chair. You know, it's, it's like a, I guess it's like a young child's chair, really. But it's pretty, has some very beautiful um, carving on it. Really uh, excellent condition. And I um, painted it by hand and glossed it by hand in this new color that I've mixed recently to make the chocolate again, the, the nice chocolate color that I'm repeating again and again. Everyone seems to be most comfortable with this shade of brown. This, this shade of brown doesn't offend people. Very interesting conversation. Mm. Um, yeah, being too dark. Mm. Like some of my earlier uh, figures were darker and even Latinos would get upset with me for making them so dark. Um, Very interesting. It is interesting. And this color here, it's sort of a really milk chocolate, right? And I took the Datos Sagrados, uh, which is the circular data pieces, and created a data piece which is based on the number of Latinos that have been killed in COVID. And this particular is 27.3% of all American deaths in COVID are Latino. And so you can't see the blue lines very well on this screen, but the circle is divided up into a series of shapes. Uh, and I painted 27.3% of those shapes. You can see the really nice. Um, is it 20% uh, uh, of, is there a smaller circle inside the larger circle or is it of? of, there's, a series the, of there's a series of lines in here that are divided this piece up. Yeah. In, to um, a series of spaces, and then I painted 27.3 of those spaces. If you could imagine that there was 100 spaces in this circular form, then 27 would be painted brown. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of fun. I mean, I've been, you know, all of a sudden you're stuck at home and you've done a lot of shopping for objects. And so the first thing I began to do was to look around at what I had purchased before and finishing pieces. Um, it makes sense, you know, you don't want to go out, you have a lot of supplies in the studio and you want to use them. So I just began fulfilling the completion of the object. This is a really nice one here. Can you see her? Yeah. Can really you tip her uh, forward a little as so we can see that the markings on the chest? That's, yeah. It's a uh, jaguar tattoo. Look at her skin, looks pretty good, right? That's awesome. A nice, por nice profile. There, I put it against the white. And really mm -hmm. nice uh, hair. And then on the back, there's a, a repurposing of one of my own paintings. So I not mm -hmm. only repurposed the plaster object, and make it, well, you know, the tattoo is an interesting thing because it not only makes it contemporary, it also makes it ancient because people of color tattooed their bodies for centuries, right? So we're getting back to it now. But this is a, actually a Victorian, what, a Victorian um, statuette. I like her a lot. She has very beautiful eyes. Yeah. And this, of course, is uh, our good friend Pinocchio. <laughs> he looks like a big chocolate candy from Easter or something. He does. He hey. <laughs> looks like you could knock him and then eat the, the, <laughs> the, eat the cream on the inside. It's, it's interesting because when you see how tall it is, I mean, here's my hand, right? You see how tall it is that to find a, a statuette of this size is pretty difficult to do when you go out to secondhand stores. It's a pretty difficult thing to do to find something as detailed as this. So yeah. this is nice chocolate and I bought myself a really good spray gun and I've been spraying these things myself. And that's one of the things that I bought so that I could continue painting more easily. Mm. The one behind me here, and I won't pick up for you, but I'll show you a picture of it in a second, is a Coca-Cola bottle. And uh, I, this 
This piece is about 28 inches high, has a straw sticking out of the top, and it's filled with uh, one inch circle balls, wooden balls, kind of like a carbonation, if you will. And I can show you a larger image here if I share the screen for a minute. Go to my Facebook page really quickly. So you can see this pretty large Coca Cola bottle that has etched um, ancient style designs on it, Aztec style designs on it. And there's sort of windows inside that I didn't paint. And then I filled it with these brown balls and put a, a big straw on top of it. It's called It's the Real Thing. And the real thing is brown. Uh, the real thing is uh, edible, drinkable, desirable, bubbly. Uh, the real thing is etched with uh, uh, cultural symbols and symbology. Uh, I was, uh, I mentioned earlier in our private conversation that the amount of money that Latinos spend in the United States constitutes the seventh largest economy in the world. We must drink more Coca-Cola than anybody. And it was really fun to find this object um, in, uh, in the store. Uh, I was very happy when I found it because I find that, you can see me lifting it, it's pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. Pop culture, it has a, a very uh -huh. large, you see the balls on the inside. And is there a, uh, a significance to the balls on the inside? Is there a, um... Yes. Um, whenever I work on new pieces, I always try to drag what I call drag forward something from the older pieces. So what I had in the older pieces was the brown dot. Yeah. And in this case, the dot became three dimensional and became a brown ball. And so is that a, um, uh, 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 just a reference or is there um, a significant number of balls that are in there? Well, what you might say is that 75% um, of uh, American Latinos living in the United States are, are, are legal. They're legal immigrants, 75%. And if we, if we use a, a different kind of a mathematical formula, then we can say that the Coke bottle is 100%, and then I put 75% chocolate balls into it, which constitutes the 75%. <laughs> so rather than just having a flat plane where the numbers are, are counted on a flat gridded formula or on a flat circular formula, I'm just saying almost in a, in a, a different kind of mathematics that the full bottle constitutes 100% and that the number of balls signify uh, a certain percentage or a certain uh, data formula. Yeah. You like that? Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. 75% of immigrants are lawful. That's what it says, lawful immigrants, which is a very mm. interesting thing because it's contrary to what a lot of people believe. Um, yeah. 30, over 30% 30 of uh, Latin American immigrants in the United States have been here for three generations, including myself. Yeah. And a lot of people don't think of Latin American, uh, Latin American people, citizens, in that way. They yeah. have a huge idea that we're all illegal, that we all just got here. And the truth is, is that we help build the railroads. <laughs> we really help build the railroads. I've been doing some studying. Latinos are a part of the fabric of the United States. We help build it, just like the Irish, just like the Italians, just like the Blacks and the Chinese. We help build this country and make it the great power that it is or was. We'll see how it all turns out. Yeah. Yeah, and it's um, powerful what the statistics can do because um, mm -hmm. 
it's a more objective than a subjective bias. So. Right. I say that uh, we need to look at ourselves and know ourselves, and we also need to see how uh, we need to understand how other people see us. When you say that 75% of Latinos are lawful, right away people are like, "Is that true? That can, is that true? Is that really true?" Yeah. Well, all you gotta do is type it into your browser. 75.5% actually. I've yeah. done another piece based on that as well. So I like data a lot because I learn about myself. I learn about um, my culture. I learn about what it means to be brown in the United States, which is really a topic of um, important, an important and timely topic today, especially today, um, like never before, apparently. Never before again, because here we are again. And um, it's important that we know what the truth is. And people ask me where I get my data, and I usually use government sources, uh, and also I use a lot of the Pew Charitable Trust. They've been doing a very large study of Latinos in the United States for a decade now, and they have some fabulous data based on uh, studies and interviews and surveys and all kinds of things that they have collected. Um, it's really wonderful data to get to know yourself. This piece up here on the far on my right and your left uh, are some new pieces. There's another one here. Uh, there are wall hanging vitrines that have little uh, rooms in them, a uh, little furniture. I even have some little pieces here I can show you. They're kind of cute. Okay. Wow. Some cute little brown chairs. Yeah. Yeah, they're really, really nice. I have this one up here. Let me get it for you. Wow. It's a polka dot sofa, a yeah. modern polka dot sofa. And so they sit, they sit in these little rooms, uh, polka dot rooms, rooms with brown polka dot walls, uh, beautiful furniture all painted and polka dotted up. And um, these are a part of um, the new conversation that I am delving into, which is the politics of power. Mm. And it's because I've been doing the politics of color, class, culture, and now I'm working on power. And that's why I'm studying about the history of the railroads. That's why I'm studying about the history of the Latinos in uh, the Civil War. Interestingly enough, we were in the Civil War. <laughs> and our history in Texas and how that all came about in terms of the Mexicanos in Texas and the Indígena in Texas and South and uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and then of course, uh, California. And my questions have all been based on the idea, the questions have been based on 1850 to 1900. That's why I'm doing all this little Victorian guys, all this little Victorian furniture, because I'm asking myself, what was it like for Latinos when power was built in the Northeastern United States, when the Carnegies became the, uh, the, the, the most inf one of the most influential families in the world, but the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, right? What happened? What, where were the Latinos at this time? Who were we at that point? Where did we live and what did we do? Mm -hmm. And uh, again and again, uh, the reality is, is that, you know, because I, collecting finery from um, uh, the, the Victorian American Victorian age and collecting finery. And uh, this piece here is actually kind of like that. Um, antique Victorian porcelain piece. Yeah. It's really in beautiful condition. And I have several really beautiful objects of finery from that age. And the truth of the matter is that when the great American, when old money was being built, uh, corporate America didn't have, there wasn't any regulations. It was an unregulated business. And so some families could make billions of dollars, literally building the railroads and uh, you know, my, the, steel, the steel factories of the Carnegie's. Um, to become very, very wealthy while the Irish and the Jews and the Blacks 
and the, you know, worked very hard in these factories. They had no um, regulations to stop children from working or the number of hours that you could work or the conditions under which you worked in. Um, uh, you know, what they called them was um, unskilled workers. And that's how they managed to consider paying people, some people less than others, by calling them unskilled workers. Mm. And um, we were on the railroads. Uh, the Pacific Union Railroad uh, uh, had between 70,000 and 100,000 Latinos, Mexicanos, Mexicanos, uh. actually, and Mexican Americans working every year. And you know, a lot of the photographs that I found are of uh, Latinos in the fields, of course. You know, Latinos in the fields. Mm -hmm. So the juxtaposition of this really incredible wealth with this, the stainless steel tables and all of the finery of the, of the materials and the cloth and the beauty of the lifestyle and all of the accoutrement of the wealthy, right? Versus the worker and the poor, you know, the, uh, what they call the unskilled worker. And I'm, it, it, it's pretty stark. And so a lot of the work talks about the power. Where did the power come from? Where was, what did the power do? Were we powerless? What was going on during that time? So we can have a sort of a historical view of it. Yeah. And nowadays, you know, they're calling us essential workers. So yeah. Know, yeah, language makes a very big difference on how people see things. Let's see what else we have here. This is an old piece that I found and I just wanted to finish her off. She looks pretty familiar to the Brown Belongings people that came to the Brown Belongings show, but she is really quite beautiful. She has a really, really beautiful face. And um, again, that very beautiful chocolate brown body. And I'm thinking about putting a really nice tattoo on her back. Mm -hmm. It's a really big tattoo, but I'm not sure what, what yet. I haven't gotten that far. Yeah. yeah. And great contrast as well with the towel. Yeah. This really sweet figuring. So lots of study going on. You know, I'm doing lots of reading. You know, all of us sequestered at home. I'm doing lots of reading, lots of study, lots of data work, and then um, catching up on pieces that need to be finished. Series that I've begun, but because of everything that went on last year, I didn't have a lot of chance to produce. I was in a lot of panel discussions and traveling a great deal. And so now that I'm at home, I'm sort of, um, it's a good time for artists to work and to be at home and to be relaxing with the process and the producing. It's a really lovely time, although it's, it can be a little lonely. Yeah, it's, it's great to see the way that the series are kind of cross-pollinating and, and um, also moving forward into the new series. Well, is that a, uh, mm -hmm. Oh, is, I was just going to ask, is that uh, kind of chandelier looking thing, something oh. that's going to be brown or? Anything? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's again, I'll, I'll come around and you can see. It's a giant gaudy chandelier or candelabra. I'll move for a little bit here. You know, it's again about the politics of power and what did people have? You know, how did they live? Can you imagine? This is how some this is how some people lived. While my great while my great great grandmother was cooking tortillas over a comal uh, on a fire, an outdoor fire. <laughs> and some people actually lived like this. And they not only, there's not only two candelabra, but there's also a very large clock. I'm with the chair so you can see a little bit. Wow. Yeah, they're pretty, they're pretty gaudy. <laughs> pretty horrific and gaudy, but um, it, it's kind of interesting to think that so much of uh, what uh, decorative work and opulence is necessary, you know, in a life. So you can kind of imagine that these would be painted chocolate brown like the yeah. model. 
And then, of course, the brown candelabra. There would be brown candles. Yeah. And I have an installation idea for it that I think would be pretty interesting uh, in terms of talking, beginning the conversation about the politics of power and, of course, uh, influence, access, all of the things that come with wealth. There is like something that. satisfying about uh, seeing that, you know, with that, um, uh, about browning that out, you know, it's, uh, yeah. I find it very, I find it very satisfying to think about. It. I think it'll be really a monumental piece. And I have an idea of putting it on a, um, um, on a, 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 a shelf on the wall that you cannot see, and then to have a painted fireplace below it, in brown, of course, the whole thing would be brown, but there would be like a decal, if you will, of the fireplace below it. Mm. You know, and uh, you know, a mirror behind it, and I have, I have some, I, I have, I'm doing some work with mirrors right now as well, and uh, decals of different kinds, brown, of course, uh. brown decals. And I have um, another. So, I, the mirror does the the decals that you put on the mirror kind of play with your reflection and exactly, brownness. And, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, Let yeah. me show you one. I'll show you yeah, one. Yeah. So you can imagine all this accoutrement sort of filling into a to an installation of, if you will, right? With the wall piece and the, yeah. the, the screen objects and this. This is a really nice piece, actually. You can see the details. Yeah. And the paint job I did myself. And so there would be a mirror in here with a decal on it that, as you said, would play with your brownness. It would play with your brownness. I have um, I have some miniatures. Every, there's a lot of miniatures going on right now, but you can see these very beautiful miniatures. This very beautiful flower. Oh, see yeah. these sort of Victorian style, beautiful little vases. Well, I have I have life size ones that look like this too. So you're looking at a room of sorts with. Um, uh, the trains on the wall with the little vignettes, the very large installation objects, uh, pieces like the chair present in another installation. And what's coming to my mind is that you have all these antique objects, as it were, um, and even you have some pop, all of a sudden pop shows up in the middle of it. And then you have a very modern uh, installation furniture like the vitrines. So you have this mixture of the old and the pop, with the, the, with the antique, the pop, and uh, interesting modern style installation furniture, which kind of brings it into the future and brings it into the present. I even have an element uh, that I'm working on that was sort of stopped by all of what's been going on, but it'll come back. It's a musical, I have a musical interlude that I've designed that I think would be very interesting to go along with these pieces. So you mm -hmm. have a series of objects, plus you have actual sound. You have sound involved as well. And now, how does that work? Well, I imagine that I have two actual Victorian chairs. Yeah. And they kind of, let's pretend that they kind of look like this. They don't, but we'll pretend that they look like this. And uh, these still have to be polka dotted. I have the polka dots are really arduous to make. And they're sitting here on a, uh, against a wall. And possibly you see these very large um, polka dotted uh, paper in the back of the uh, vitrine sh shapes. There would be a life size polka dotted wall behind it. And then on the wall would be two sets of headphones. And you would pick up a headphone and you would get to listen to something and then there would be something to read. And uh, the music is actually based on um, a small theory that I've been working on for quite some time. And uh, 
I, uh, you know, I visit Hawaii almost every year. And uh, I, I love uh, traditional cultures. You know, I love Aboriginal culture. I love the African culture. I love the Native American culture. I love Mesoamerican culture. I love, you know, I love antiquities mm -hmm. and the beauty of the traditional, what they call, what, what the people in it call the traditional, what other people call, I don't know, I mean, ethnic maybe they call it. And uh, what I noticed is that in Hawaii, that uh, you know, they uh, relegated the Hawaiian people to uh, being the, uh, the happy-go-lucky native with the little Hawaiian music, you know, the little guitar. Yeah, but yeah. We have, we're poor, we're downtrodden, but we get to play this happy-go-lucky music and aloha. Mm. And the reality of it for the Hawaiian people is that they live in the interiors of the island in poverty with pretty bad education system. And all of the resorts are built on the most beautiful land and oftentimes the land that was the sacred land to the people and all the best views are, you know, 600 bucks a night. And they've relegated the Hawaiian people to be these happy-go-lucky, you know, la 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 yeah. happiness, right? And, uh, I began thinking about the African Americans in the United States because uh, you know I went to middle school in Montgomery, Alabama, so I have a great feel and love for the African American and the history of the African American in the United States. And it dawned on me that they took the drum away from the people when they arrived from Africa. They weren't allowed drums. And I've talked to people about this, and my theory is right on. They took the drums away because they were afraid that the drum would cause insurrection. Well, they took the drum away from the Hawaiian people, too. And that's how they ended up with the little ukuleles and the little happy-go-lucky, and they relegated them to this you know, sunshiny aloha people. And the African-American people, uh, the drum was taken away, and what they had was choral. They took on choral and uh, choral music. You know? Mm, oh. Yeah, the choral, you know, the, the male yeah. choral voices. Mm. Because they were afraid once again of the drums, same thing. And um, when uh, the conquista took place in Mexico, it's the first thing that went to was a drum. Uh, oh. First went was the, you know, the, the big drum, the, what, what people would coin as the war drum. But really it was a drum of many things. It was the message drum. It was the calling drum. Right, it was a warning drum, it was a gathering drum, it was a drum to honor someone who had passed away or a birth that happened or a wedding. There was many reasons for the drum, not just war. And um, so in thinking about the drum, I mean, they've relegated the little Mexican to the sort of the oversexed, the oversexed male and the little coqueta girl that does, uh, you know, has no power at all. I mean, it's just pretty poor living. Yeah. yeah they, they kind of just dumb us down. It's good. We've been dumbed down and the drum was taken from us as warrior cultures, right? The warrior <laughs> culture. So my idea is to put the drum back. And that's as much as I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to put the drum back. So yeah. I think it's a pretty good, it's a fun kind of theory to think about you know, uh, people of color, what the heritage is, what the offering is to contemporary culture, uh, what it means, what we, what we could have brought that we didn't get a chance to bring along with us, how we've been sort of uh, stereotyped and dumbed down. And, you know, we need to begin seeing the way, we need to begin thinking about the way we see ourselves and how other people see us so that we yes. can get a, a clearer sense of, you know, what we have to offer. Not only to others, but to ourselves as well, to our own families, to our own communities, to, to our own children. Yeah. So you can imagine the room and it's got, can you kind of imagine the room now? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah. A lot, there's a lot going on and I, I actually have a list and I'm just sort of checking it off as I'm going through it uh, with uh, what, I'm, what I'm sort of imagining this installation to look like. You know? Yeah. I imagine floor, I imagine wall, I imagine life-size, miniature, contemporary, antique, and even going as far back as what Brown is really all about. In this case, I'm saying it's the drum. That's exciting. You like yeah. it? 
Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. I'm, 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 I miss my friends. I miss seeing everybody. Um, virtual's nice, but you know, nothing can replace a hug. Yeah. And eye to eye is always so nice. Um, but it's time to make sure that we stay working. Um, time that we stay focused and stick to our work and to what's important in our lives so that when this is done, we can come up with a lot to share. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm.